Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I am so glad to see you all here. So in this video, we are going to talk about file formats that are associated with chip sequencing. So before that, we are going to talk about what is chip sequencing. We are going to take a look at the protocol. In addition to that, we are also going to talk about various terminologies associated with it. And there are some basic concepts that are associated with chip sequencing that we are going to talk about in this video. In addition to that, we are also going to talk about how the data is organized in these files and what are the common file formats that you'll come across when you're dealing with chip sequencing. So we start by understanding what is chip sequencing. And this was something that we briefly spoke about in one of my previous videos where we were talking about uh, different types of high throughput data. So as we all know, DNA, which is a double stranded structure, is coiled around these proteins, which are called histones. And that structure is called nucleosome. So basically, this structure further condenses it into forming uh, something called as chromatin. So there are certain processes that control the expression of genes by altering the chromatin structure. Now, genes which are actively transcribed are associated with accessible chromatin regions, while genes that are not expressed or are transcriptionally silent are found in the inaccessible chromatin regions. So these modifications that are made to the DNA and to the protein which impact the chromatin structure are referred to as the epigenetic marks. ChIP-seq stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing and this allows for identification and um, characterization of these uh, modifications. More importantly, it allows us to identify um, transcription factor binding sites because transcription factors play an important role in regulating gene expression. And in addition to that, it also allows us to identify the patterns of histone modifications. So basically, these modifications to the histone proteins influence the chromatin accessibility in a particular region. So this technique has been previously used by scientists to identify where P53, that is an important tumor suppressor protein, binds across the entire genome in normal human cells. After the protein is crosslinked to the DNA, uh, the cells were split open and a specific antibody uh, was used to identify and isolate the chromatin fragments containing the bound protein. Once they purified the DNA fragments, they used high throughput sequencing techniques and computational methods to map these millions of sequenced fragments to the genome. What they observed was that P53, which is a tumor a suppressor protein, had differential binding pattern in normal cells compared to the cancer cells. So chip sequencing method allow the scientists to identify differential um, binding patterns of an important transcription factor which has a tumor suppressor role and it allowed them to further um, study the mechanisms of P53 uh, in cancer. So now we are going to look a little bit more into the details of the experimental workflow and the computational um, ChIP-seq pipeline. So the first step in the experimental methodology is um, cross-linking the cells with formaldehyde to preserve the binding of the proteins to the DNA. Um, this process covalently links the protein to the DNA. Followed by that, um, the DNA is fragmented using sonication or enzymatic digestion, um, shearing the DNA into smaller fragments. And these fragments can range anywhere between 50 to 500 base pairs. Once the DNA uh, is fragmented, um, the next step involves immunoprecipitation using specific antibody. And in immuno immunoprecipitation step essentially enriches the fragments that are bound by uh, the protein of interest. Uh, once we have immunoprecipitated um, the fragments which are bound by the protein of interest, we basically cross, cross link, uh, reverse the cross link. So basically we free the DNA that is bound by the protein of interest for further processing. So basically we will only retain those fragments which are bound by the protein of interest with giving us these regions where these proteins bind. Once these reads um, are fed into a sequencer, the output of these reads are stored into a FASTQ file and that brings us to the computational aspect of the chip sequencing uh, workflow. So I have previously discussed on what a FASTQ file is and what information is stored in a FASTQ file. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I will add the link to that video in the description section below. With the raw reads uh, from the sequencer in the FASTQ file, uh, we start with quality control, uh, which involves trimming the poor uh, quality bases, adaptive removal, and even filtering the reads which are poor quality. And we end up with um, high quality and uh, the reads that pass basically the quality control metrics. Uh, once we have those reads, we move on to aligning it to a reference genome and aligners like star or bowtie too can be used to align them to a genome. 
and the aligned reads are essentially stored in BAM or a SAM file. Uh, essentially, these are the file formats that stored the uh, stores the information about the read alignment. And I have spoken in depth about these file formats and how to understand the data that is uh, stored in these files in a previous video. So I will be also adding the link to that video in the description section below. Now, once the reads are uh, aligned, in order to identify genomic regions that are significantly enriched with the protein of interest, in simple terms, basically to identify where the protein of interest binds in your um, DNA or to find where the histone modifications occur, something called as peak calling is performed. So basically, peak calling outputs us the regions which are significantly enriched uh, with the binding of the protein or um, basically showing the histone modification compared to the background. Now it is crucial uh, to compare the output of peak calling uh, enrichment in a sample with that of an input control, uh, which is a sample that has been crosslinked with the protein of interest but has not been immunoprecipitated. Uh, we will be talking about the controls used in a ChIP-seq experiment in the upcoming slides. Tools like MAX2 and HOMER are essentially used for peak callings and the peaks that are identified can be further used for downstream analysis like uh, differential binding analysis where essentially one can compare the chip seek profiles between different conditions or cell type to identify differentially enriched regions. One can also perform motif analysis where uh, one can search for overrepresented DNA motifs within, within the enriched regions to identify potential transcription factor binding sites or simply annotating the peaks to identify the genomic features. There are also tools available which normalize the reads and allows us to uh, visualize the enriched regions as tracks or as heat maps. Uh, and there are several tools or um, web applications or browsers available to visualize the ChIP-seq data. And this is something that we will ta be talking about a little more in detail in the upcoming slides. Now, talking about the controls in ChIP-seq experiments, they are very crucial and it is important that all the chip uh, enriched samples are matched by appropriate control samples. Uh, such control samples should be acquired from the same cell type under the same conditions as the test sample and ideally be processed in parallel. So these are the two types of controls which are usually used uh, in a ChIP-seq experiment. So the input control is a type of a negative control. It involves uh, preparing um, a separate sample where chromatin is cross-linked, fragmented and processed in the same way as the chip sample but without the immunoprecipitation step. So this control represents the total genomic DNA content of the cell population before any specific protein uh, immunoprecipitation occurs. So the purpose of this in input control is to provide a baseline measurement of the DNA fragment distribution and sequencing biases, which can occur during uh, library preparation and sequencing. It helps researchers distinguish the true chip enriched regions from the background noise and artifacts uh, introduced during chip seek process. The other type of control is the IgG control, uh, which is a specific type of input control uh, that involves using an immunoglobulin G antibody for the immunoprecipitation step uh, instead of the specific antibody against the target protein. Uh, IgG is a non-specific antibody that binds to various proteins uh, and DNA in a non-specific manner. Uh, by using IgG as a control uh, in control, uh, researchers can assess the level of non-specific binding of the secondary antibody using the chip procedure. So this control uh, helps distinguish the true target protein-specific signals from the non-specific background signals that may arise uh, due to secondary antibody during immunoprecipitation step. Because IgG controls can often produce relatively uh, little amplifiable DNA, input controls are more widely used uh, to normalize signal from the ChIP-seq experiment. So here I wanted to show you examples of different types of ChIP-seq profiles and depending on the type of the protein or histone modifications, the ChIP-seq profiles can have different uh, features. So for example, ChIP-seq for uh, a transcription factor, usually the peaks are sharp binding peaks, whereas uh, for the chromatin marks uh, or histone modifications, the peaks uh, would encompass a larger genomic region. So basically this would uh, correspond to a broader peak compared to those of the transcription factors. So there are proteins that essentially um, showcase a mixture of both these profiles. An example of that could be RNA polymerase 2, which essentially can have narrow or uh, broad peaks depending on whether um, it's detecting transcription initiation at the transcription start site or propagation along the gene body. 
Now, an important concept uh, in Chipsy experiment uh, is um, irreproducible discovery rate, which basically measures the consistency between replicates in high throughput experiments. So the central idea behind this is that if we have replicates in our study, so essentially these replicates measure the same underlying biology. The, the idea here is that the most significant peaks, which are likely to be genuine signals, are expected to have high consistency between replicates. Peaks with low significance which are more likely to be noise are expected to have low consistency. So IDR can be used to assess reproducibility in high throughput experiments like chip sequencing and can be used to measure consistency between uh, two biological replicates. Uh, it compares ranks of peaks in individual replicates or pseudo replicate sets and peaks with high rank consistency are retained. Um, IDR can be used on true replicates resulti resulting in a conservative output peak set which is high confidence peaks representing reproducible events or can be used on pseudo replicates. IDR can be used as a quality control metric to evaluate the consistency and reliability of your chip sequencing data. If the IDR analysis reveals poor reproducibility between replicates, it may indicate issues with the experimental protocol or data quality prompting further investigation or the need for additional replicates. One of the biggest sources of publicly available data, uh, ChIPSeq data, is uh, available on ENCODE platform. So ENCODE stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. For any of you who might have not heard about this, this is basically a public research consortium uh, which is aimed at identifying all the functional elements. And the data on this platform can be accessed using their portal. Um, they have extensive amount of ChIPSeq data. So at some point, um, you might require to download ChIPSeq data from this portal. And there are some terminologies that are associated uh, when you download this data uh, from their portal. So essentially, when an experiment does not have a true replicate, a true biological replicate, then a pseudo replicate can be created uh, by subsampling reads uh, without replacement from a sample. Um, relaxed peaks are the set of peaks which are essentially identified with less stringent criteria during, during peak calling and it contains both signal and noise. Uh, the peak set contains uh, many false positives. And followed by that, we have conservative peak set. So basically, these are high confidence set of peaks which are identified by IDR uh, on replicated peak data uh, across true biological replicates. And optimal peak set are essentially high confidence set of peaks which are identified by IDR on replicated peak data across pseudo replicates. Um, threshold peaks are essentially referring to those set of peaks which are identified by using a specific statistical threshold or cutoff and ranked peaks are the set of peaks from a high throughput experiments that have been sorted or ordered ba based on some criteria. So talking about the file formats, the ChIPSeq data can be stored in um, two types of files, in binary files or in text or tabular files. Within the binary files, we have uh, BigWig and BigBed files, and these files are essentially used to visualize the signal in a genome browser. So Big, BigWig file format is essentially used to display dense continuous data that can be displayed as graph in a genome browser. And BigBed Big Bed format stores annotation items that can either be simple or uh, linked connection of exons. So basically, these are created from bed files, but they are uh, in the in an indexed binary format. So both the BigWig and the BigBed files have information that cannot be visualized in a text editor or on command line, but they have to be loaded on a genome browser for us to be able to see the ChIPSeq peaks um, that are stored in those files. Also, the signal that is present in BigWig can be uh, expressed in two ways uh, as fold change over control at each position or, um, or it has p values for each peak which indicates that uh, the significance of the peaks and indicates that the peak that is present at a position is not by random chance. On the other side, the ChIPSeq uh, enriched regions can also be stored in a um, text file uh, ending with .bed or .narrowpeaks or .broadpeaks. And these are tab delimited files which stores information about the peaks or the enriched regions that are called by peak calling algorithms. And we will be looking at these files in further detail in the next slide. 
So basically, these are the narrow peak and the broad peak files uh, from ENCODE, basically storing the information about the peak uh, or the enriched regions from the ChIP-seq data. And the narrow peak file is in the bed 6 plus 4 format and the broad peak is in bed 6 plus 3 format. So basically these bed formats are known as extended bed format and is a file format commonly used to represent um, genomic intervals and associated information. Um, the bed 6 plus 4 or 6 plus 3 format, basically the bed extended format is an extension of the standard bed format which contains 6 columns representing basic genomic interval information and the additional 3 or the 4 uh, columns in the end uh, provide supplementary information about the intervals in this case about the peak regions. So let us go through each of the fields now to understand what information is stored in them. Uh, there is a minor difference in narrow peak and broad peak file and we will get to that when we are going through each of these fields. So starting with the first field here, um, the first field in both the file uh, sh uh, store the chromosome information, the name of the chromosome or sequence identifier where the peak is located. Uh, the second field indicates the starting position of the feature uh, in the chromosome or scaffold. Uh, so basically this is starting of uh, starting position of the peak uh, in both the uh, files. Um, the third field in both the files indicate the ending position of uh, the peak in the chromosome or the scaffold. The fourth field indicates the name given to the peak uh, in each of the files. Uh, if no, uh, if a, a dot or a period is used, uh, it indicates that no name or a unique identifier is assigned to uh, the peaks. The fifth column um, indicates uh, uh, the score for the peak. So basically the score denotes the average signal enrichment for that region. So basically this is the average between replicates. So basically the average of the read counts over that region. Uh, if the score is high, it means that a lot of chromatin from that region is pulled down by immunoprecipitate and is sequenced. Followed by that, the sixth field in both the files store the strand information. The plus or the minus indicates uh, the strand or orientation. A dot or a period is used if no orientation is assigned. The seventh field in both the files um, store the signal value, which basically provides a measure of the strength of the ChIP-seq signal at each peak, indicating the level of enrichment of the target protein or histone modification at that specific genomic location. The next field, that is the eighth field in both the files, indicate the measurement of statistical significance. These are basically uh, negative log uh, 10 transformed p-values which are associated with the peak. Um, the use of negative 1 is, uh, indicates that there is no p-value that is assigned. Uh, so basically, p-value represents the statistical significance of the peak which is often computed uh, on the enrichment of reads in the chip sample uh, compared to the control or the input sample. The ninth column in both the files uh, provide us with the negative log 10 transform Q values which are also known as false discovery rate. Uh, the Q value represents the adjusted um, P values accounting for multiple hypothesis testing and peaks with lower Q values are considered more statistically significant. Um, the negative one indicates no Q values are assigned. Now you'll notice that uh, in the narrow peak file, there is an additional uh, column present, which basically provides us information about the peak. So basically this is the genomic position of the peak summit, which represents the highest point of the peak. So this is often used as the representative location of the peak and it's only present in the narrow peak. It's not present in the broad peak file. So since you cannot visualize your binary data uh, or cannot open it in a text editor or on command line, uh, tools like IGV or UCSC Genome Browser allows you to load the BigWig and the BigBet files to visualize the peak signals and the peak regions um, in the Genome Browser. Um, similarly, you can also use uh, your BigWig files to obtain um, global evaluation or enrichment around the transcription start site as many cis regulatory elements are close to transcription start site of the targets. Uh, you can also use these files and there are packages available like deep tools which allow you to create such heat maps and density plots which basically allows you to evaluate the read density across all transcription start site. So that's all I had for today's video. Um, thank you all for tuning in to this video. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more uh, bioinformatics related content. Um, as always, I will be adding useful resources and link to my previous videos in the description section below. Please leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comment section below. Once again, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, see you.